Welcome to this podcast. Uh, I'm Dr. Charles Gieschen here at Concordia Theological Seminary, and we'll be uh, presenting on the gospel lesson for Epiphany 2, Series A, which happens to be from John. Keep in mind, even though our, our focus is on the gospel of Matthew during Series A, you have occasionally these texts from the gospel of John. So happens Epiphany 2, uh, gospel lesson is from John chapter 1, verses 29 to 42a. Uh, a couple of points just before we get into the text itself. First of all, uh, this text is a nice transition from our focus on the baptism of Jesus last Sunday, namely from Matthew's account in chapter 3. Why? Because you have a retelling in this account of Jesus' baptism so you have that close connection. Uh, also, you have the focus on John the Baptist's testimony, obviously John being the one who baptized Jesus. Uh, a second thing that I think is important to emphasize in introducing this text is that it, it has several uh, important titles of Jesus. There's almost a heaping of titles in this section from John chapter 1, uh, verse 19, after the prologue, all the way to the end of the chapter, there's a heaping of the titles of Jesus, uh, and we have several of them in our text today. This fits certainly with the epiphany theme that in Jesus we have God manifest, that's seen in these titles that reflect who he is, his person, and what he will do, his work. And then thirdly, uh, another important theme uh, that fits with this epiphany season something that you certainly would want to bring out in your preaching of this text, is this strong theme of mission during the Epiphany season. First thing that happens after Jesus um, is baptized is he calls his disciples. Uh, there is this invitation to come and see. What a wonderful invitation for the Epiphany season. Uh, for us, too, to invite people to come and see this Jesus who is God made manifest. So, with that introduction, let's jump into the text. And uh, this text, actually, from uh, John chapter 1, follows right after some of the testimony of John the Baptist. So, as it begins in verse 29, uh, you have this emphasis on the next day. We see that twice. It's somewhat stylistic of the Gospel of John. Uh, this first week of Jesus' ministry you have sort of a telling on the next day, on the next day, you get to the wedding to Cana, and then it says the third day. So it's just somewhat of a stylistic um, marker of time in this account. Uh, we see it twice, verse 29 and again in 35. On the next day, he saw, it's historical present, uh, it's re the, the subject here is John the Baptist. So John uh, the Baptist is the one who is doing the scene here at the beginning of this account. Uh, he sees the subject, he sees the direct object, Jesus, who is coming towards him. And uh, what does he say? Here's the first great title, wonderful title. Um, uh, you know, the Gospel of John is, uh, is very, um, uh, it's given us a, a very important uh, title of Jesus. It's right here, uh, Behold the Lamb of God. Uh, we see this title twice in these few verses. It's found again a little later in verse 36. Uh, Lamb of God, uh, as a title for Jesus, is probably uh, grounded in Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, if you'd like to read a little bit more about this title, um, there is an article that I've written in uh, CTQ, uh, volume 72, uh, number 3, uh, that's July 2008, and if you look on page 254, uh, and this section goes through 256, you'll see a nice discussion of Jesus as the Lamb of God. And the point I make in that article is that this uh, noun is based or, or drawn from Isaiah 53, 7. Uh, so you have John the Baptist very early in Jesus' ministry 
identifying him with a title that points forward to his atoning work. Uh, Isaiah 53, the lamb bears sin and atones for sin. Even though you don't have this participle in Isaiah 53, you do have the language of, of um, caring or bearing sin uh, in Isaiah 53. Here, you have the participle, the one who takes away the sin. And I'd like to emphasize here, it's singular. It's not just speaking of it's not just speaking of particular sins, but it's speaking of the sin, namely the totality of sin that enslaves humanity, that enslaves the world. Jesus is overcoming that entire reality, namely by taking it upon himself as the sin bearer and taking it away. How? He takes it away uh, by his atoning sacrifice of the cross. Now notice it says the sin of the world. This is one of the beautiful statements of what we would call um, universal justification. That he doesn't just take away the sins of certain people and not others. But he's taken away the entire sin of the entire world so he can free the whole cosmos. Uh, and certainly we recognize only those who believe will actually benefit from this. But nevertheless, it's, it's speaking of the universal action of Jesus, both in atoning for, for sins and in freeing the entire creation from sin. Uh, so this is a, a very important first title. You'll notice that I highlighted several titles in red. We'll see some, some of them as we go forward in this narrative. But that's the first one, and one might say that how did... Um, uh, John have this kind of insight? Well, I think it's grounded in the fact that he understood Isaiah 53 messianically. And so he understood that a vital part of the Messiah's work is that he would actually uh, bear sin and atone for sin. And so when he knew Jesus as, was the Messiah who is coming, he identifies him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, verses 32 um, excuse me, verses 32 and 33 make it clear, though, that John didn't come to this insight on his own, but it was the Spirit through the baptismal uh, event that actually gave him the insight of uh, Jesus' identity. So, very important first title, and then uh, he, uh, he goes on, this is the one concerning which I spoke, and here, this is a reference back to earlier uh, in Jesus' ministry, or earlier in John's ministry. It's mentioned in 117, or excuse me, 114, 115. Uh, 115 in the prologue, this very phrase, um, namely, a man uh, comes after me uh, who is before me, who has come to be before me. That one is prior or more important than me. I think uh, this is a reference actually not just to the importance of Jesus, that's how it's often translated, but I think it's actually a reference to the pre-existence of Jesus that is so strong in the prologue of John, so that what John is emphasizing is the divine nature of Jesus. He is a man who even though he he is revealed after John the Baptist. He actually existed prior, came to be prior to John, uh, and is of gr much greater significance in the sense that he is, um, um, you know, even before John was born, uh, the son existed. Uh, and so John, certainly with this testimony, which is found in 115 of the Gospel of John, and also right here, is emphasizing the divine nature of Jesus, the divine significance, uh, uh, and also separating himself. He is a great prophet, but he is uh, nowhere to be compared in terms of uh, with the person of Jesus. And then in verse 31, the point I made earlier, John doesn't know all of this on his own, but it's been revealed to him through the baptism of Jesus. You see that in the kind of emphasis 
that is given in these personal pronouns, kai ago, kai ego here, well, where, and also, I did not know him, namely, I did not recognize him on my own, but in order that he be revealed to Israel, this one uh, came uh, that, that I, in uh, baptizing with water, uh, that was through the baptizing with water of the Gospel of John, then this purpose was fulfilled, that he be phanerothe, beautiful word that actually is from what uh, epiphany comes from. We have phino, uh, so you have epiphany, That's a, this is epiphany language. Uh, he is manifested or he is revealed to Israel. So on account of this one being revealed to Israel, um, John, who is speaking of I, namely John, came baptizing with water. So it, this is simply expressing the purpose. His whole purpose in baptizing was not only to call people to repentance, but also to uh, be one who would be used to reveal uh, to Israel this Messiah, namely Jesus. And then verse 32, and I uh, testify, you have that word from uh, the verb here, from mar uh, martyreo, namely to bear witness. Uh, we think of it in terms of bearing witness unto death, but obviously here he's just speaking about bearing witness uh, in his ministry. So, um, and he, namely John, bear, bore witness, saying that, so this is how he, what he was bearing witness to, um, and here he says, I have beheld, so you have the, the perfect tense uh, verb, the Spirit coming down, so this is, John does not record the actual baptism of Jesus, but he records John the Baptist reflections or remembrance of the baptism of Jesus, and that's in these verses. So last week you preached on the baptism of Jesus. Here you have an opportunity to also proclaim how, from John's perspective, what he witnessed and, and how God revealed um, Jesus as the Messiah to him. So I um, have beheld the Spirit uh, descending from Katabino as a dove from heaven and remained. He remained on him, namely on Jesus. This verb we're going to see in the Gospel of John is very important. Uh, meno. I remain. And so here the emphasis is the Spirit remains on him, continues to be with him. Jesus is in union with the Holy Spirit. That's something we testified to in the Gospel reading last week at the baptism of Jesus. Certainly John's Gospel puts a lot of emphasis on this. And that's why Jesus is the one who can give the Spirit and also baptizes with the Spirit. Very important verb uh, as, as you read the Gospel of John is this meno. Uh, Jesus also uh, remains in us and we in him. That's where some of this language comes out. The union within the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one that is also then a picture for the union between Christ and his, his uh, church. Then you have again the uh, chi ego here. Uh, and I did not know him. So you have this same language from verse 31 repeated again here. That this wasn't something he knew by nature, but he knew by special revelation, by the revelation that was given him at the baptism uh, of Jesus. But this, the one sending me to baptize, here you have the infinitive expressing purpose, with water, that one said to me, namely the Spirit who sent him to baptize, said, uh, upon whom um, the Spirit uh, uh, descends and remains upon him. This one is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So here again, John understands Jesus as Messiah, as the Lamb of God, because he has been told that he would witness the Spirit descending upon 
um, uh, Jesus in a baptism. So when that actually happened, then he understood this is the one. Um, so John is the, the gospel that actually helps us to see uh, how John the Baptist had a clear understanding. Uh, it was by special revelation. He had been told that he would witness the Spirit descending uh, uh, upon uh, and remaining upon the one who would baptize with the Holy Spirit. And that's again a distinction between John's baptism and Jesus, the Christian baptism, is the strong emphasis of the giving of the Spirit in, in baptism. And then, and I have seen, perfect tense, and I have borne witness, again, perfect tense. I have seen this in the past, continues to be an ongoing reality. I have witnessed this, been borne witness to this in the past, continues to be an ongoing reality, that this one, namely Jesus, who we baptized, is the Son of God. This is the second major title we have in this section. It's called the Lamb of God. Here he's called also the Son of God. Uh, again, a heavy loaded Old Testament term, Jesus being the Messianic, Davidic King, the true Israel, the true Son of God, um, and uh, very much a part of the confessional titles that you see in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Not as prominent in the Gospel of John, but certainly found here. Now if we scroll up a little bit, we'll get to continue on with the second half of this text, which is verses 35 and following. And with, uh, we start off again with this stylistic time marker. Okay. Okay. We start off again with this stylistic time marker, which is uh, on the next day again, John, and here's the verb, was standing, he was, uh, he was uh, present, with uh, here the mention of two of his disciples. Later on we're told one is Andrew, we aren't told who the other one was, but these are followers of John that John is now directing to Jesus. Keep in mind that uh, the, in Epiphany, one of the themes we see is Jesus calling his disciples and his disciples beginning to, to bear witness to Jesus, who he is and what he will do. And this is where it starts. You have Andrew and one other disciple hearing John's testimony. And so, um, uh, and upon, after he had seen Jesus, so you have the participle, another participle, Jesus was walking. So you, after he sees Jesus walking, then he says, namely John the Baptist, once again, a reiteration of that title. So one can say the fact that it's repeated again shows how important it is. And this is all climaxed uh, in John's Gospel in John 19, uh, where at the death of Jesus it mentions that uh, his bones weren't broken. Uh, namely, he was the, the uh, lamb who was blameless and who was sacrificed, part of the atonement theology in John. It's also mentioned in the article that I, um, that I referenced earlier from CTQ. Then uh, John goes on, uh, or then the gospel goes on and says uh, here that um, the, the two disciples, they heard John's testimony, um, they heard him speaking, and they followed Jesus. So basically, they heard the gospel testimony of John the Baptist, and that led them to, to follow Jesus uh, right here. And so you have this language of discipleship uh, in, the CERN, in terms of them following after Jesus. John points them to Jesus, and then his own followers become followers of Jesus. Uh, again, wonderful part of the epiphany theme of this text is this emphasis of testifying to Jesus and then others following him. And then uh, uh, Jesus, who uh, uh, after he turns, you have the participle here, and after uh, he beholds them following another participle. So you have all these participles speaking of kind of the, the sequence of action after Jesus turned and after he beheld them following, then, here's your main verb, he says to them, 
What are you seeking? You have the interrogative pronoun, and you just have an open-ended question. What are you seeking? Uh, and then what do they say? They say, Rabbi, here's another confessional title. Uh, it's explained here, having been translated, it means teacher. Uh, sometimes we think of this as a very low confession, but keep in mind, Jesus was uh, certainly much more than a teacher, but he also was a teacher who had disciples. And so here already they're acknowledging his teaching, they're acknowledging him as a rabbi, and they're his now seeking to, to possibly be his disciples. They were followers of John the Baptist. Now they're following Jesus. So they say, Rabbi, where are you remaining? Again, interesting use of the verb. Basically here we could translate it, where are you staying? The Spirit is remaining in Jesus. Now they're asking, where is Jesus physically remaining or staying? And then he answers that conversation with an invitation. The uh, imperative, come, another imperative, see. Come and see. Uh, I would say uh, a wonderful part of this uh, is the, the epiphany season emphasizes mission. And certainly from this invitation, we have a great mission emphasis throughout the epiphany season. We testify to Jesus who he is, what he is doing in terms of being the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and we invite people, come and see. Um, a vital part of uh, what we as the priesthood of all believers in the church seek to do is to have people come and then hear and see Jesus in the worship service. As Jesus is testified to, as his work is, 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 is witnessed to and proclaimed, uh, and his presence and the sacraments are seen, People can come and see and learn and believe and then also follow Jesus. Uh, you have uh, then, therefore, they came and they saw where he was staying and they basically remain, here again, meno, they are remaining that day with him and one of the reasons why uh, John mentions here that it was the 10th hour. Keep in mind, if we count the hours from day daylight on, this would be late afternoon. So it was not a time in which you begin maybe to, to move about. They don't have cars with lights on. Uh, so usually your travel at night was limited. So it's the, the um, uh, late time. So they remained with him. This gave the rabbi, Jesus, time to explain and witness and testify to them. Uh, not a lot is said about that, but no doubt that's what went on. This is where great epiphanies happen, namely these disciples come to know who Jesus is and what he is about through the interaction. Uh, they actually came and they then saw him for who he, who he is. And then it tells us specifically, as I mentioned earlier, that one of the disciples was Andrew, who is the brother of Simon. The reason why Simon Peter is mentioned here is obviously later we know he's one of the, he is the key leader disciple. Uh, so he's mentioned here because uh, that puts Andrew in, a, in relationship with him. Andrew, obviously one of the first uh, disciples, one of the 12. So he was one of the two of the ones following Jesus. And, um, and, uh, and they followed him. And uh, then you have in verse 41, uh, you have uh, the mention just here. Let me see. Then it mentions what Andrew did right after um, this. He found, so it's mentioning Andrew. Uh, first, his brother, Simon, and then what does he do? He says to him, we have found the Messiah. So basically, by remaining with Jesus, he has been brought to um, the conviction and, and faith, first through the testimony of John the Baptist, then through hearing Jesus, that Jesus is the Messiah. 
And, and John explains that which, having been translated, is the Christ. Messiah basically means the anointed one, the Mashiach in Hebrew, uh, which is in Greek, Christos. Uh, certainly a major confession of Jesus uh, in our Christian context. Uh, we, we say Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one. And then this beautiful statement uh, at the uh, end, he led him, namely Andrew led him, Peter, to Jesus. So again, taking that mission theme of Epiphany, and it's being brought out in that last verse. So you have, first of all, Jesus inviting, and then Andrew inviting, and actually then leading. And so one might say, in this very text, we see not only an important epiphany of Jesus through John the Baptist's testimony, but we also have a beautiful picture of how the mission of the church goes on as Jesus invites and then others invite because they have met Jesus. They have heard him, seen him, so they invite others to come and hear and see him. And one might say this is the whole foundation of how the mission of the church goes on in every generation. We come and we hear and see Jesus and then we invite others and lead others to come and also see Jesus and taste and see that he is good. He is the Lamb of God who has taken away our sins, taken away the, sin, the world's sin so that uh, we might have everlasting life. May the Lord bless your epiphany proclamation of this wonderful gospel text.